Good morning, and welcome to the session on altering, extending, and enhancing Drupal 8. Um, this is room 271-273. I'm going to be talking about um, various ways that module developers can interact with the Drupal runtime in order to do whatever it is that your modules do. Um, if that doesn't sound like what you're interested in, or if like partway through the session you're like, I'm still not interested. Uh, I, all the sessions are recorded. Totally feel free to get up and find something that is of interest to you. I will have no hard feelings. Um, otherwise, there is a, a link on this slide, a URL that you can go to that is a link to the slide deck itself. Um, so you can keep the slides for later. The other thing is there's a, a lot of, a bunch of slides in here that are really just lists of links to various resources that I've found useful in order to help explain some of these concepts. I'm not going to actually like expect you to write down all of those ones. So just write down this one and you can get links for the rest of them very easily. Um, before I get started, well, I guess I already started. Before I get too far, a little bit about myself. My name's Joe. I work for Drupalize.me. I've been doing Drupal development for at least 10 years at this point. I kind of lost track somewhere along the line and decided that it didn't really matter. So I usually just say, I've been doing this for a long time. Um, and I really love doing it, which is why I'm still doing Drupal development. At Drupalize.me, I spend a lot of time working as a trainer. I help produce training material that does things like explain how you might interact with Drupal's runtime. Um, I really get excited about like sitting around and trying to come up with analogies for how you can take something like Drupal's event system and relate it to other real world things that people might know about. So if you like complex analogies that explain technical concepts, we can totally hang out and have a beer and talk about that. It'll be fun. I promise. Um, otherwise, yeah, I've been, I, I do that. I spend a lot of time um, teaching people Drupal and these types of concepts, which is why this is a particularly exciting um, presentation for me to be able to give, because it's really like, this is the kind of thing that I enjoy doing, um, being able to help explain some of the more technical bits of Drupal and hopefully make it a little bit less complex and a little easier to understand. <clears throat> Let's see if my slides actually change. There we go. Um, so this presentation is going to cover a handful of things. Mostly, I'm going to be talking about the various ways that a module developer, or really a module, can extend Drupal core. Um, the ways that during the, the process that Drupal goes through to build a page or service a request that you can interact with Drupal and the things that it's doing. In Drupal 8, there are a handful of ways that you can do this, including plugins, services, events, and hooks, all of which we'll cover. I'm gonna give examples of kind of the use case for each of these different methods and talk about, sort of compare and contrast them. And the hope is that when you leave this session, you'll have a better idea of what tools are available to you so that you, when you're writing a module, you kind of get an idea of how you can participate in that request um, service. And then also allowing you to be able to choose uh, or make an informed decision about, do I want to create a plugin for this or should I be using services and being able to um, compare a little bit of those things. There's, there's not a lot of code. There are a couple of code examples, mostly just to show um, some kind of a little bit about how things work. But mostly this presentation is geared towards helping you make that decision and understand what each of the um, methods are. I just won't change my slides. This is going to be an adventure. Here we go. Um, so, and the reason that we talk about this and why I think this is important, in the Drupal community we have this sort of phrase or axiom, don't hack core. The idea being that as a Drupal developer, I should be able to write code that interacts with anything that Drupal does or change anything that Drupal does without having to modify the core code. I should be able to alter the login process. I should be able to add new features. Um, kind of, as a module developer, the hope is, anyways, that you can do all of these things without modifying core. The benefit is if you can write your code without having to change Drupal core's code. It makes things like making security updates easier. You don't have to keep track of the modifications that you made every time that you're applying, um, you know, Drupal 8.1 comes out or 8.1.1 with some security enhancements. You don't have to keep track of what did I change and do I need to apply those changes again or did they get applied already? Um, so, and then there's also, um, <clears throat> I lost my train of thought. Hold on. Hmm. So, 
The other thing that I would say about this is if you find that you're in a scenario where you feel like you would like to write code that changes Drupal and you can't without modifying Drupal core, I would probably consider that to be a bug in Drupal core and that that's something that's worth creating an issue for and filing a patch, making it possible for others to extend or enhance that aspect of Drupal without having to hack core. And then the hope is that we end up with this infinitely flexible Drupal core in which you are free to come along and change anything that you would like at any point, um, more or less. The other reason I think it's nice to talk about these tools is because as module developers, we're often trying to create tools that are somewhat generic, like Drupal core, that other people can alter and enhance without having to hack our module, for all of the same reasons. I would like to be able to develop a module like, for example, the voting API module, and allow other people to provide new plugins for how you might tally votes um, or interact with the forms that the module creates without having to hack that module themselves. And so if you understand how all of these interaction points work, you can both implement them in your code, but you can also make it so that other people can use those tools to participate in whatever it is that your module's doing, tallying votes or displaying things on the screen or whatever that case may be. So in addition to looking at how you could implement each of these patterns, we'll also talk a little bit how about, you could, about how you could invoke one of the patterns, um, so dispatch events or invoke hooks and so forth. I think that when you start trying to break down each of these concepts and understand which ones you should use and why, it helps to have a little bit of a background on the types of things that Drupal is trying to do or might um, want to ask your code about. And so I kind of break this up into like four different tasks that a module might do. One of them is respond to information or events. So certain things, certain, all kinds of things happen whenever someone's viewing a page in Drupal. And uh, when a node gets saved or when somebody logs in or when the page itself is first loaded, Drupal dispatches events or it says, hey, anyone that would like to participate in the fact that someone just entered their password and submitted the form, now is your chance to do so if you'd like to. So basically providing opportunities along the way for someone to step in and say, hold on a second, I'd like to do something a little bit different here. Another thing that modules do a lot of in Drupal is answer questions. Um, and if you're familiar with Drupal 7 development, this is often done in the form of like an info hook. But there are questions like, hey module, do you have any blocks that you would like to provide so I can put them in the user interface so that someone could choose one of your blocks? Or do you provide any new field types that someone should be able to choose from when they're creating new content types or um, things like that. So basically, your code needs to be able to answer questions that Drupal has about the functionality that that code provides. Modules provide new functionality. So Drupal core does a lot, but there's also a bunch of things it doesn't do. And so one of the primary reasons that you would write a module is to add a new feature. Um, whether that's a, a tool for building web forms or a system for tallying votes or, or whatever the case may be. Um, adding additional functionality above and beyond what core already provides. And the corollary to that is altering functionality that core already provides. So um, the, the various modules that are in core that, for example, provide a list of blocks or make it possible to create a contact form, rather than just get rid of that module completely and replace it with new but only slightly different functionality, your module could also choose to alter the existing functionality. Um, so these are kind of the types of things that a module might want to do during the process of servicing a request for a page in Drupal. Which again, comes back to that idea of don't hack core. Instead, take the opportunity to do things like answer a question with a hook or use a plugin to provide additional functionality or write a service that provides new functionality or respond to the fact that someone's trying to log in and you'd like to change the password um, verification system by responding to that event. We're gonna talk about these four methods for altering Drupal hooks, plugins, services, and events. In no particular order either. I really, I, I have no explanation for why they are in this order. It's not like this one's more important than the other ones. It just happened to be the order that I felt like talking about them in. 
Um, the first one is plugins. Plugins is a system that's new in Drupal 8. Um, actually, all of them, except for hooks, are new systems in Drupal 8. Um, I uh, think that likely as a, a module developer um, making the transition from Drupal 7 to Drupal 8, or even if you're just getting started the first time with Drupal 8, plugins are probably one of the first, if not the first um, developer experience you'll have creating a module. Um, usually people get started do, trying to do relatively simple tasks like create a new custom block. Um, that's something that might be implemented as a plugin. Um, but so we talk about this because it's probably something that you'll encounter pretty early on. <clears throat> what are plugins? Plugins are a combination of a tool that answers a question. So Drupal has some context in which it needs to know um, what are all of the things that provide blocks? What are all of the things that provide fields? What are all of the things that provide functionality X? So a plugin needs to provide metadata about the functionality that it provides. And then plugins also add new functionality that doesn't already exist in Drupal. Is that like, can you guys hear the feedback? Yeah. All right. Well, I'll try to, I have no idea why that happens. <laughs> but plugins I know all about. Um, <clears throat> so, so some of the things that I like, like about plugins, they think about plugins as a way of providing new configurable functionality for various components within Drupal. Almost always where you have a scenario where in Drupal 7 you would have done something like implement an info hook that describes the functionality and then a bunch of callback functions that implement the functionality, that's generally in Drupal 8 going to be replaced with plugins. Uh, otherwise, it, it's fairly similar. Um, you've got a system provide, for providing metadata about the functionality and then um, the code that actually provides it. I like plugins a lot. I feel like plugins provide a bit more of a consistent experience for people that are um, learning how to write code for Drupal. In Drupal 7, you would often end up with like, you know, implementing a, a new block in Drupal 7. It's, it's, it's not necessarily hard, but you have to learn all of the right pieces, and it's hard to understand what those are. You learn that you have to create an info hook so that the admin UI can find the block. And then you also have to like create a you know, hook block view and hook block save, but there's nothing that really d ties all of that together other than they happen to be hook underscore block underscore something. So you figure out how that works by searching api.drupal.org for hook block and then see what pops up in the automatic list. And you're like, oh, that kind of sounds like what I want to do. Um, the nice thing about plugins is that when it comes time to implement the functionality, you're almost always going to be working off of um, a class. So you'll have an interface that you can implement, which describes basically the types of things that you could do with this plugin. And you also get to put all of the code that provides the functionality in one place. Instead of spreading it across a bunch of different um, randomly named functions or callbacks, you've just generally you'll create a single class that provides the plugin and encapsulates all of that functionality functionality in one place is pretty slick. Uh, examples of things that are plugins in Drupal 8. Um, blocks is the kind of example that I, I come up with the most. Um, it's a, a classic example of there's, sorry, a system in which Drupal needs to be able to get a list of all of the things that provide this type of functionality. And then Drupal also needs to be able to Really, that's the thing I'm going to get applause for? <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, so, so plugins, blocks is a great example of a system where Drupal needs to know how to get a list of all of the blocks that are provided by all the modules that are currently installed on this particular site. But not only that, it needs to be able to do things like consistently be able to know what the label is of the block that it needs to display in the admin UI. Or it needs to have a, met a known method that it can always call to display uh, whatever the content of that block is. Field types, field formatters, um, view styles, and actions in Drupal are also other instances of things that would be plugins. 
One of the things that I find frustrating about plugins is I can't really figure out the best way to, to know what all of the different types of plugins that I might want to implement are. Um, I generally will look at core at, for an example of if I know that I want to add a new field formatter, I'll try to go find a module in core that's adding a new field formatter. Once I see the code, and we'll take a look at some examples, you'll pretty, be able, you'll pretty quickly be able to recognize that this is a plugin implementation. Um, but there, there isn't that I know of yet any like one page that you can go to that lists awesome. that lists all of the different plugin types. <laughs> <laughs> All right, fine. We'll go to the next slide. <laughs> um, the recipe for implementing a plugin. So once you know that the thing that you're trying to create in your module is a plugin, here's what you need to do. First, you need to figure out what type of plugin it is that you're implementing. Is it a block? Is it a field formatter? Is it a field widget? Knowing what type of plugin it is, and there's actually a handful of different plugin uh, there's, a, there's the type, for example, it's a block plugin, but then there's also various ways in which the plugin system can discover plugins of a given type. So is it an annotated plugin? Is it based on a YAML file? And so forth. Knowing that will inform the rest of what you need to do in order to implement something of that type. Um, so once I know that it's a block plugin, I also know, okay, block plugins are annotated plugins which means that the metadata that I need to provide, because you're going to have to provide information for any plugin so that Drupal can read that and, and create a list, the metadata in this case is going to be part of an annotation on a class. And it'll also inform, uh, in, this, in that case, for an annotated plugin, where the class should live in the code base. So what uh, namespace it should live in so that Drupal can discover it. There is. I believe there is actually always uh, in core, um, though this may not be true, um, so it may be almost always, a base class that you can extend for a given plugin type. If you think about it, tools like blocks, for example, a lot of the functionality uh, between all blocks is fairly similar. Like most blocks in Drupal have a configuration form that allow you to choose which pages it's going to show up on, set the title and some other basic information. And so instead of having to repeat that for every single block plugin, I could extend the base class, which provides that configuration already. I can alter it if I want to by optionally like overriding that method, or I can just leave it as is and get away with kind of doing the bare minimum amount of work. So I highly recommend extending the base class uh, when it exists and you're implementing a plugin. And finally, depending on the plugin type, there will also be an interface. This is required for every plugin type. Um, so you'll find the class that is the interface for that plugin type. And the, the awesome thing about this is now I know all of the different methods that I could implement for this plugin type and what they're going to do. Instead of having to go to api.drupal.org and search, search for hook underscore block underscore and then wait for the list to populate so I can figure out what do these things do? Um, I can just look at the interface. All the documentation will be right there. I can say, oh yeah, the thing that I wanted do is change the content that's displayed. So I'm going to override this method. Um, this is a, a, a very simple, somewhat contrived example of what a plugin might look like. It's a class. Um, ex it's extending a base class. So this plugin provides new flavors of ice cream, because who doesn't like ice cream? Um, it lives in a namespace that was determined based on me knowing that I'm adding a new ice cream flavor plugin. It provides the metadata that Drupal needs in order to discover like the list of plugins that here in the comment at the top of the class, this is called an annotation, um, and then the functionality of, of what that plugin does. If you're a module developer and you would like to add a new plugin type, the recipe for doing so is, uh, is as follows. Um, Examples of when you might want to add a new plugin type are any time that your module provides some kind of functionality that you would like others to be able to add to the list so that an administrator can choose one or more items from that list. Um, I use the voting API module as an example a lot for this. And so if you're the maintainer of a module like voting API, you might want to provide one simple way of tallying votes, but leave it open for people to provide infinite number of other ways of tallying votes. So I might do, you know, just add them all together, but you might need instant runoff, or you might need your votes are worth two if you vote on Tuesday at 2 p.m. Um, whatever the case may be, um, 
you could write those plugins. Drupal will provide a list that an administrator could choose from uh, which one of those would be active at any given time. If you want to implement a new, if you want to allow for plugins, what you need to do is declare a new plugin type. Um, the easiest way to do so is by extending the default plugin manager class that's part of Drupal core. Um, this will go through and basically set up a whole bunch of sane defaults for you in terms of um, how to collect metadata, where the code should live, um, but still give you the chance to override any of those as you need to. <clears throat> this slide has a lot of links on it, which is not very useful when we're in a conference room like this. So, like I said, you can download the slides at this link down in the bottom corner. Um, this has a lot of resources that I've found useful when trying to understand the plugin system. <clears throat> services is another way that we can um, alter Drupal. Services are probably best used when you're trying to provide new functionality to Drupal. Um, so similar to plugins, the difference, the primary difference I think is probably that with plugins, you would like to allow administrators to choose um, from a list of many plugins and be able to have more than one active at any given time. So blocks, again, a page might have multiple blocks on it at the same time. Whereas services are generally useful for functionality where you'll probably only ever have one active instance of that functionality. You'll only ever have one database connection. You'll probably only ever have one Twitter API client service um, uh, functionality at any given time. <clears throat> services are a way of encapsulating functionality into a bundle, um, like a, generally just a, a class with a known interface, making it easy to access any of the functionality that thing provides without necessarily having to understand the internal mechanics of how it works. So you could say, hey, Drupal database service, make a query to the database. And you could you know, call the query method but it doesn't really matter what happens during the time. It it's, might be querying Mongo, it might be querying MySQL, it might be querying some external um, database elsewhere on an API or something. As far as I'm the de developer I'm concerned, I know I can call this method and expect this output when that happens. Um, services are awesome. They, they provide a way of allowing the functionality that um, we use to, to interact with all the various different things like external APIs or create forms in Drupal or even the implementation of a plugin type to be decoupled from um, Drupal itself. This allows for better testing. Um, it also allows, so basically you can swap out one service for another. As, assuming they implement the same interface, you could say the Twitter module has a service for querying the Twitter API. But when I'm running tests, I'd like to use a mock version of that service that doesn't actually do all of the work of going out and querying Twitter and getting the information back. It'll just respond every time with a known message, making the tests run really fast and a little bit easier for me to write. <clears throat> Services typically uh, replace what in Drupal 7 were like global functions. So you'd have all these PHP functions, like for example, to access um, Drupal's database abstraction layer that were like db underscore something. Um, and they're in the global namespace so that you can make use of them from everywhere. In Drupal 8, those are almost always replaced by services. Uh, and then services are accessed through the um, services container, which is basically just a giant repository of all of the services that Drupal knows about and a, a method for saying, hey, give me a copy of the database service or hey, give me a copy of the form building service. Um, some of the things that are services in Drupal 8 include, like I said, the database access is a, um, a really commonly used example. Um, the caching system, the all of the various tools that are used to um, optimize and collect the various CSS and JavaScript assets in your site. Um, plugin managers is actually kind of cool. The s services are used to provide all of the other functionalities that we're talking about here. So hooks are provided by a service, uh, events are provided by a service, and plugins, uh, each plugin type, which is a plugin manager, is a service of its own. If you're writing new modules, uh, probably the, the most common use case for when you would create a new service are things like 
um, I'm providing functionality to interact with an, an API. Um, I, for example, the Twitter module would provide a Twitter client service. Um, or any other time that your module is attempting to provide functionality that both your module and others might want to make use of. So instead of declaring a bunch of global functions, you create a new service, declare it to Drupal, and others can make use of it as well. There is a ton of different services in Drupal 8. And I find that the best way at the moment to figure out what those all are is if you go to api.drupal.org, over on the right-hand column there's a link um, for services. It'll give you a big list of the services that are available in core. And you can start to filter through that list um, and find the, the things that you're after, whether it's a, the tool for connecting to the database or the um, you know, HTTP client for making requests to other uh, APIs. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. If you want to create a new service in your module, um, so bundling up some functionality, um, both for yourself to keep it decoupled and easy to test, so you could maybe provide a mock version of that service, and so that other modules could make use of the service, what you would do is the following. Um, the first thing you need to do is choose a unique name for your service, uh, which basically means make sure that you prefix your service name with the name of your module. So you might end up with something like my module dot Twitter API, or my module dot um, you know, voting counter. The next thing you need to do is define a uh, interface for your service. Even if you're only going to provide one version of that service, um, I still highly recommend providing an interface so that, one, you'll have really good and consistent documentation of the things that someone could do with that service. So your interface defines all of the methods uh, on the, that class that someone can make use of. Um, and two, it ensures that like future you or anybody else could write another service that could be just as easily swapped in um, for the, the one that you're providing. You'll need to register your service with Drupal. So you add a .yml file that provides Drupal with a bit of information about the service so that it can add it to its service container, making sure that when you're ready to use the service, you can get a copy of it from the service container. Just use that to identify it by name. Drupal will be like, sweet, I know where to find that code. Here's a copy of the class that you're after. Uh, and then finally, inside of your code, you would access that service via the service container. Um, this is a, one example of how you might do that, this sort of globally asking the service container, saying, hey, give me a copy of the service by name. Um, probably what you would more likely end up doing is using dependency injection so that the service gets injected into your controller that's displaying the page. Uh, and this is part of that whole process of being able to l allow things to be more decoupled so that they can be tested. If you're injecting the service as a dependency into your class, it makes it much easier for someone to say, you know what, in this particular context, instead of injecting the full-blown Twitter API, go ahead and just use my mock client instead. This is a page with a bunch of links. That's not that useful here. But again, um, uh, you can download these slides and these links help provide more information about what services are available and how you can make use of them in your own code. There is also a presentation today at 1 p.m. that's going to talk about uh, dependency injection. The, the title of the presentation is um, what is services and dependency injection and how does it help me? Um, I, if you're interested in this stuff, that seems like it would be a really good presentation to attend to get a better idea of how this aspect of extending Drupal will work. And there's also a presentation tomorrow at 3.45 uh, titled OOP is nothing to be afraid of, um, which I was going to cover a lot of some of the basics of um, implementing interfaces and creating interfaces and how all of that works. Again, a great thing to attend if, if this idea of creating services and dependency injection and that is a little like, oh, I don't know what I'm getting into. Another way that you can extend Drupal is events. Events are used in, in, in instances where the Drupal system needs to be able to broadcast to anyone that might care, this is what just happened, feel free to do something right now. Um, an example of that might be something like when a user logs into the site, 
Drupal wants to be able to allow anyone that's interested to respond to the fact that a user just logged in. Now, you're probably not making any changes to that. You're not say, necessarily altering the fact that they logged in, but you're responding and saying, oh, hey, whenever somebody logs in, I also want to do this other thing above and beyond what Drupal already does. Um, <clears throat> so basically, events are a way of allowing you to react to different uh, actions that take place within the application without making changes to itself. Events are new in Drupal 8, and they're actually sort of fairly limited at the moment. Not, there aren't a lot of them at the moment. Um, you will encounter them. There are a handful of instances where um, events are being used to replace what you probably would have done in the past by just uh, implementing a hook. Um, they, the reason that they're being incorporated initially is because Drupal 8 builds a lot on um, Symfony components. And Symfony makes heavy use of events in order to allow people to modify the way that different Symfony components work. And then Drupal has started to implement some of this as well. Um, the places that I've most commonly seen them so far are in um, when Drupal is building a list of routes, so the paths that someone could use in order to access content, um, there are a couple of different events that are triggered during that process that you can respond to in order to change the list of routes or how they work. Uh, they're also used a lot by the, um, the migration API in order to allow you to do things at various different points during that um, extract, transform, load process that your migration goes through. Um, events are a really common pattern outside of Drupal in the larger OOP world. Um, and I think part of what we'll, we'll see is that over time, more and more of the things that we're used to doing with hooks in Drupal will start to transition to being events. Um, when you talk about events, you're going to do one of two things. You're either going to subscribe to an event that someone else is broadcasting. You're going to tell Drupal, hey, Anytime someone performs this event, let me know, because I'd like to do something. Well, at least I'd like to figure out if I'd like to do something. I just want to know that this is happening. And you do that by subscribing to an event. You need to figure out what the name of the event is that you're going to subscribe to. Um, you need to, <clears throat> inside of your services.yml file in your module, um, you need to provide a bit of metadata. This is the part where you're basically telling Drupal, hey, whenever this event happens, let me know. And here's where I would like you to send the message to. And then you need to provide the code that deals with getting that message. So you, you might have a class that looks something like this, um, which has a couple of methods that say, um, you know, give me the data. This event just happened. Call this method and give me the data. And I can choose if I want to do anything with that information or not. Um, and so that's useful if what you're trying to do is respond to events provided by some other module or by Drupal core. The other thing you might want to do is dispatch your own events. So if the voting API module wanted to allow people to um, modify the way that things work or simply respond to the fact that someone had just cast a vote, maybe the module would broadcast an event. So anytime someone cast a vote, it would say, hey, is there anybody that's subscribed to this particular event. And if there is, go ahead and notify them right now that that event just happened. Um, you can do that by um, creating a new class using the events namespace. So th this is the PSR4 um, namespace pattern that you would need to use for implementing an event. Um, <clears throat> And you need to provide a couple of different classes. The first one you need to provide is really just documentation. So you provide a new class that's in this events namespace. Um, and if I remember correctly, off the top of my head, it just has like one or maybe two different properties that are like, this is the name of the event. And it gives you an opportunity to say, here's the documentation for what this event does um, for anybody that would like to know. Uh, and then you need to add a new class <clears throat> to the um, Excuse me. Um, you basically need to add a, another class that is an extension of the, um, or adds to this, the Symphony event dispatcher. So like I said, the events 
that, or the fact that Drupal is starting to make use of events started at least from the fact that we were making use of Symfony components. We're building off of Symfony's event dispatcher. We basically need to declare to that event dispatcher, hey, I've got events that I would like you to be able to know about um, so that I can broadcast them. And then finally, in your own code, whenever you reach the point in the flow of that code where, for example, someone just submitted a new vote or just logged in, you need to tell the event dispatcher that that just happened. Go ahead and send out the message to everyone that's listening. You can also at that time provide some additional context. There's basically you can say, not only do I want you to notify everybody, here's the message that I would like you to put in the envelope when you send it. Uh, again, some links to resources on uh, responding to uh, events. I, this, the second one on this list is, is one of my favorite. It's from the um, Symphony documentation and I feel like it does a really great job of not only explaining um, how, to, how to dispatch or subscribe to events but just kind of the principle of events in general. <clears throat> and there's a session about the Symphony event dispatcher today at 2.15 p.m. So if you want to know more about the innards of how dispatching events in Drupal 8 works, uh, that would be a great one to attend. And finally, we got to talk about hooks because without hooks, we wouldn't really have Drupal. Um, hooks are not new. Hooks have been around since basically forever. I tried to look this up for this presentation to see when hooks were first added to Drupal core and like by like grepping through the law history and all of that and I ultimately decided that it's probably sometime around March or April of 2001 is when the concept of hooks were introduced. And then I looked at the code that's in like whatever version of Drupal is from 2001 that was like the implementation of the hooks and I compared it to the code that we use to like invoke and dispatch hooks today and it's like basically the same thing, which is kind of crazy to me. But I think it also helps um, give a sense of like just the fact that like hooks work really well and they've served us really well for a long time. Um, in previous versions of Drupal, everything that we've just talked about would have been handled with a hook. Providing new functionality, altering existing functionality, uh, enhancing Drupal, all of that was done through hooks. And now we have things like plugins, services, and events that accomplish similar things in ways that are hopefully a bit more um, easier to understand, uh, easier to document and make use of. Um, <clears throat> the, so hooks work by basically providing a function in your module that follows a specific naming convention. Uh, as long as you name your function the right way, if your module is enabled, Drupal will call that function. And this is, that's what this code does. It basically says, if the function exists, call the function. And like the major difference between 2001 and 2016 is now there's like 13 layers of try catch statements before it calls the function. Um, hooks are awesome for situations in Drupal where you need to alter some existing data. And this is probably where, you're where you will encounter them the most as a, um, a module developer. Things like, for example, Drupal has just gathered a list of all of the block plugins and it would like to give you a chance to make changes to that list before it does something with it. Or Drupal has just used the form API service to build a form that it's going to display on the page and wants to give anyone that, um, it is participating the opportunity to make changes to that form definition before it's displayed. Hooks are super fast. It's just simply a, a call that checks to see if a function exists and if it does, it calls it. Whereas some of the other things like the event dispatcher um, are, I, I, don't mean, I don't want to be like, wow, it's super slow, don't ever use it. But it's certainly a little bit slower and has a bit more overhead. Um, Drupal provides a lot of functionality to make that faster. Um, but one of the things, one of the reasons that we still see a lot of hooks in Drupal 8, despite the introduction of events, is because they're just really fast. Um, and there's also just an element of, like, they exist because at the time that they were added to Drupal core, there wasn't really a, a good way to do these other things. There wasn't um, PHP's object oriented syntax infrastructure was not nearly as good as it, as it is today and didn't really allow us to do things like dependency injection with services, plugins, and so forth. Um, I don't actually know of any presentation this week that is going to cover 
hooks. But I bet if you went and looked up every single previous DrupalCon, you could probably find a presentation about hooks. Uh, examples of hooks, um, the one that you're going to encounter first and use the most is definitely hook form alter. Um, this is allowing you to make changes to any form that's displayed within Drupal. Um, <clears throat> the other time that I see it used a lot still is any time that you're trying to make changes to lists of data that Drupal has already aggregated from some other system like plugins um, or a service. Um, the, the hook form alter one is particularly interesting. I think that, again, over time we're going to see more and more of Drupal move towards using events just because it's a more widely used pattern in the rest of the PHP world and just programming in general. Um, it's a bit more, if you were at the keynote this morning, Dries talked about um, one of the desires that came out of the results of this survey that he did was people really felt strongly that Drupal needed to move even more towards a fully object-oriented architecture. And, and hooks are kind of like the like, exact opposite of that. They're specially named functions that live in a file. Uh, that, like they all live in the same file. It's not very well organized. But man, they're fast. Um, but one of the reasons that like we still have a lot of them is during the Drupal 8 development cycle there was work done to try try to convert everything to events but it became pretty quickly apparent that the hook form alter specifically was going to be quite a challenge to work as an event and for it to be really as performant as it is currently with just calling this function but again I think that over time that will get worked out and we'll see a lot of this move towards events if you want to implement a hook it looks like this Determine the name of the hook you want to implement, which basically means go to api.drupal.org and type hook underscore, and then wait for the list to populate, and then find one that sounds like it resembles what you want to do, um, and then go read the documentation for it and discover that that's not actually the one you want, so go find the other one. In your .module file, you create a new function where you replace the word hook in the, um, the name of the hook with the name of your module and then you write your code inside of that function, and that's it. As long as your module's enabled, whenever Drupal needs to execute or invoke that hook, it will check if the function exists and calls it. Um, one of the things you want to make sure of, and this is actually true of all of these things we talked about, um, but hooks in particular, um, after you add a new hook to your .module file, you should make sure you clear Drupal's cache. There are a lot of hooks that the fact that it exists is, um, cached so that Drupal doesn't have to look it up in the same way every single time. Um, that's true of pretty much all of the ways that we extend or alter Drupal. If it feels like your functionality isn't working or isn't being added, try clearing the cache and, and see if it's um, working then. If you would like to invoke hooks from within your module, the pattern for doing that is this. You need to pick a unique name for your hook. Um, I, again, recommend probably using the name of your module. So it might be hook underscore name of my module underscore name of my hook to try to ensure that it's unique. This is actually one of the things that's great about things like plugins or services or events is we're no longer running into the same namespace collision problem that we have with hooks where you have to be really careful about um, the way that you name things so that you're not accidentally implementing like node, hook node alter in your node underscore form module, uh, things like that. Um, and then you use the module handler service in Drupal core in order to invoke that hook. If you want to learn more about hooks, um, api.drupal.org has a list of all of the hooks that are available in Drupal core. And you can also, for any module that provides them, they should provide documentation of the hook in a file uh, with name of the module dot api dot php. Um, I talked about this a little, uh, and I'm, I'm going to bring it up again because not only are we looking at a scenario where likely in the future Drupal is going to move more and more towards the use of events and away from hooks, but it's also like, as a module developer, how do I decide should my module invoke hooks or dispatch events? Personally, I think events are the way of the future and that, again, we're going to move more and more in that direction. And I would advocate for probably in most cases, if you're writing a module, 
um, dispatching events from that module, documenting those events. Uh, I think that it'll help make your code a bit more future proof. Um, but I also don't think hooks are going to go away anytime soon, necessarily. I, it's certainly going to be for the lifetime of Drupal 8, we will continue to have hooks. Um, maybe by Drupal 9, you, you might see a scenario in which everything, all of the hooks as we know them at least, are removed. Maybe we'll finally remove that code from April of 2001, um, but probably not. Um, the scenario that I come up with in which I would probably use um, hooks inside of my own module is kind of if my module deals a lot with forms, uh, particularly because of hook form alter and the fact that that's kind of your primary way of interacting with Drupal's form API as a, a module in, or, in order to alter someone else's code. Um, I kind of feel like if I was doing a bunch of hook form alters and interacting with making use of the form API, I might stick with using hooks. Primarily because I think it might get confusing if my module was like, like half the things it did were hooks and half of them were events. I mean, now you end up in the same scenario that we are here. It's like, is that a hook or is it an event? And it's like, well, it's probably a hook, but it might be an event. Um, mostly I would look for a consistency. Uh, but either way, I don't think hooks are going to go away anytime soon. So I certainly wouldn't say, you should never use hooks. Um, to sort of tie this all together, let, this is like how I might use each of these different things in the process of writing some hypothetical module. So I'm going to write a module that offers the ability to take a video file and encode it to different formats. Um, I might want to do something like have my module allow for an end user to choose from one of a bunch of different encoding utilities. It might be something like encoding.com or FFmpeg or uh, Zen Coder, there's a lot of different tools that could be used to process the file. So I would create a new plugin type that was, I don't know, encoding utility and maybe provide one or two of those with my module, but this opens up the possibility for any, uh, any one of you to come along and say, you know what, you should really use some other encoding thing. Those are the three that I know. Um, so I would um, create a new plugin type there. Um, I would implement that at least once so that you had some functionality with the module itself, and I would provide an interface so that anybody else that wanted to could create a new encoding utility. I would also probably then create a new service. The responsibility of this service would be, say, um, to take a file and encode it and give me the output. The benefit, again, of it being the, these services with an interface is I don't really need to know everything about how it works inside. I just need to know I can give it a file. It will do whatever it needs to do to figure out what type of file it is, what plugin um, the, the user has selected to use as an encoder, how to encode it, get the file back, and ultimately I'm just handed the newly encoded version of it without really caring what happened inside of that um, factory or black box. Um, I might also implement another service for, impl for interacting with um, the various encoder utilities. Um, so a lot of times what you'll see is there's a plugin type which just allows for that definition of the functionality to Drupal and allows for an administrator to choose from a list of functionality, but then the plugin might just be a loose wrapper around a service which does the, the bulk of the work. Um, in this case, that might be a service that interacts with, for example, the encoding.com API. Um, so now I've got an encoding.com client that can deal with sending files to and getting them back, but it's also, um, some, because it's a service, I can easily mock that um, API client and write tests. So I could say, you know, I actually don't want to send this two gigabyte file and wait for 15 minutes and spend $20 to encode the file. I just want you to pretend like you did it and tell me that it worked or it didn't work so I can write tests. I would probably dispatch some events as well. Um, an example of that would be right before starting the process of encoding a file, I would say, hey, I'm about to encode a file. Does anybody want to make changes to that file or, or change the parameters that I'm using to pass to the uh, encoder? And I would also probably trigger another event immediately after it happened. I would say, hey, I just got a file back from encoding. Here's a copy of that newly encoded file in case you want to do anything, like maybe uh, upload it to YouTube or 
post it on our site or, or whatever the case may be. <clears throat> Um, and then finally, you might inside of all of that code, um, your plugin types that work with it in Coder probably do something like have configuration options for you know the different parameters that the encoder takes and how it should deal with the file. I would probably want to provide a way for other modules to make changes to the configuration um, being passed to the encoder before that happens, and that would probably be a good candidate for using an alter hook. So you've, you've created an array that is all of the configuration options you're going to use for that particular file. Right before you encode it, you said, does anybody want to change the configuration before I start this task? Uh, and, and, and that's our module, and an example of how we might make use of all of those different things um, within our own module. As a quick recap of the things that we covered, uh, we talked about plugins, which are primarily a way of providing new units of interchangeable functionality to Drupal. This, the best example, and I think easiest to conceptualize, being blocks, um, but also used in almost any case where Drupal needs to get a list of things that can do X and provide an end user with the option to choose one or more items from that list. We talked about services which are basically a replacement for things that used to be global functions. Uh, encapsulating a bunch of functionality, like for example the utility for accessing a database or encoding a video into a single class. Uh, with, so you've got that discrete unit of functionality uh, providing an interface for the functionality and uh, describing it for Drupal's service container so that those services can easily be mocked or swapped out for testing or just um, you know, swapped out with a different database service if you'd rather use Postgres instead of uh, MySQL. We talked about events, which are a way of allowing um, code that's executing within the context of Drupal to communicate with any unknown number of potential listen listeners, what's going on, saying things like, hey, I just got a file back from the encoding service. Do you want to do anything about it? Um, events work by allowing code to either dispatch events to say this is what I'm doing right now if you'd like to react to that or to subscribe to events pr um, dispatched by other pieces of code to say whenever that happens I'd like to participate as well. And finally hooks, um, sort of the, the ongoing workhorse of Drupal, um, hooks are specially named functions that in some sense do all of these same things. Um, they allow you to add new functionality, alter existing functionality, um, and provide services. Um, primarily where I think you'll see them used, uh, initially at least when you're getting into module development, is for working with the form API and altering the different forms that modules in Drupal or other modules are providing. Um, I, it's, it's basically um, anything that isn't a plugin, a service, or an event is probably a hook. <clears throat> And that's what I know about writing modules for Drupal 8. Um, I'm happy to answer questions now, or if you've got questions later, you can tweet them at me, um, and it would be awesome. You see how good I did at providing the link for you to go give me feedback? Maybe you could provide feedback. Like, it'd be nice if you'd put a link to the page where I could provide feedback. <laughs> Thanks for coming. And, and we've got a couple of minutes. If anyone's got questions, I'm happy to attempt to answer them. Yeah. Sure. So the question is, are events uh, synchronous or asynchronous? And so when you trigger an event, do you have to, if there's five listeners, do I have to wait for each one to finish before I can do my thing? Uh, it's PHP, so they're, it's basically, they're, they're synchronous. Um, so, but, and then the other part of the question was, if, if you sent something off to be encoded, would you have to wait until it came back to trigger the event? Yeah.
Yeah, I think, so it, the, the question is, like, if I sent something to be encoded and it takes 15 minutes to happen, do I have to wait 15 minutes to respond? And, and the answer is yes, and probably, l likely the situation you're looking at is, in that scenario is, like, your code would trigger FFmpeg to start the encoding, and then you would also tell FFmpeg, let me know when you're done, call this PHP method when you're done. Um, and so like I could kind of dispatch to the encoder and then continue on doing whatever it was I was doing in my code. And I would expect that the encoder would call back to and basically create a whole new request that says, hey, the thing is done. Does that make sense? OK, cool. Any question? I, I can repeat it if it doesn't work. Sure. Yeah, sure. So the, the question is, um, in Drupal 8.1, the Migrate API switched from using configuration entities to implementing a migration as a plugin, um, and kind of what's the difference between the configuration entity and plugin, or why would you choose one or the other, and then why did Migrate make that choice? Um, I think that, like, fundamentally, plugins and configuration entities perform two totally different tasks. A configuration entity is, like, it, the idea is that it provides configuration data. Um, so something like the settings that you would send to FFmpeg for encoding, like, that's configuration. Uh, a plugin provides new functionality um, that generally requires some execution of a code path in order to work. The, the migrate one is, like you said, it's tricky. And I, I don't necessarily fall strongly on one side or the other of whether they should be configuration entities or plugins. Um, and a lot of really smart people made some decisions about that. And now it's so they're currently plugins. I think they were originally written as configuration entities, because the idea being it would be nice if you could, like, a migration, it, and the part of it that changed is basically the thing that does the field mapping, where you're saying, this field in the database over here is the title of the node over here. Um, and it was sort of this weird, like, is that configuration? Because it would be nice if it was, because then you could, for example, provide a user interface that allowed someone to create that mapping. You could save it as configuration, persist it so they could come back later and edit it and make changes. Um, or is that a plugin because it requires adding new functionality through a code execution path? Therein lies the, the, the real question. I was like, which one should it be? Um, I think that the it becoming plugins in Drupal 8.1 has a lot to do with um, that question of like, are they actually configuration? Uh, is like, is the migration path actually configuration? And then also um, concerns about like polluting the con the data store with a bunch of information that was related to the migration that later on you're like, we're done migrating. We don't need all of this configuration anymore uh, and some of that. To be totally honest, I don't know exactly why it switched, and it was one of those, like, I guess it changed, and now I have to learn a new thing. There's a really, really long thread about it on Drupal.org that kind of discusses the pros and cons of um, plugins versus configuration in that instance. I also think that in your own code, that's probably, it's probably, in most cases, going to be a pretty clear delineation between things that are configuration, like, for example, settings about how you're going to optimize images versus things that are plugins, um, like, for example, a, uh, a class that runs a bunch of PHP code that, you know, goes off to get information from Amazon.com and store it locally as part of a field formatter. So, 
Does that help at all? Okay, <laughs> cool. Yeah, so the question is, um, should I extend the class or should I implement the interface? And how do I know which one to do? I would say um, it depends on what the class that you're extending does and whether or not the thing that it does is useful to you. And so if, if you're extending the class but really don't care about any of the things that the base class is providing, any of that sort of prepackaged functionality, go ahead and just implement the interface and skip extending that base class. Where it's nice is when a base class provides a bunch of like generic functionality that you would probably make use of. A common example would be um, block plugins. You probably are going to want access to things like the service container injected into your block plugin and you're going to want to use Drupal's translation system because you're going to have strings in that block plugin. And if you extend the base class, those things are already made available for you. But if your block doesn't have any user interface strings and doesn't use the service container, sure, you could implement the interface. Um, it, yes, absolutely. Yeah. And so the, I mean, the concern there would be like, what happens if the person who maintains the module that provides the base class changes what the base class does? Um, I mean, you could say the same thing about what if they change the interface that you're implementing. It's a little bit of if you're working to extend someone else's code, you're kind of always at their mercy a little bit because they could change things whenever they want to. Extending is almost always good because the reason that the base class exists is generally to provide like the 85% use case. Um, and now you just need to do, you know, 15% of the work. If it doesn't provide that, then skip it, right? Because now you've got like a performance problem where it's like you're, you're, you're loading and you're executing all of this code that you're not actually doing anything with. Yep. And then also provide that as a hook. Is this, am I getting my head around this as an example of this event versus hook? Yeah, well, totally. And that's, that's the weirdness of events and hooks is it's kind of like hooks could do the same thing. You could totally use a hook to say, hey, someone just logged in, right? Like that's what Drupal 7 does. Hey, a node was just saved. Hey, someone just logged in. Do you want to do anything? Um, and, and, and so that's a little bit of the weirdness of trying to figure out, should I use an event or should I use a hook? My rule of thumb at the moment is um, I favor using hooks, especially if it's a scenario where really I'm just kind of trying to announce this happened and provide context, right? Because you can, like hook or events are like, um, events you can send a message. You can say this just happened, send an envelope with a bunch of data in the envelope and then the receiving code can do whatever it wants but it never gets a response back. It, like the event doesn't say, hey, I finished. Here's some new things. Um, hooks handle that scenario currently where, so the form alter is a great one where you say, here's the form. Do you want to make any changes? But I need it back when you're done because I still need to display it. Or configuration for the video encoder. It's kind of like, here's the configuration we came up with, but I still, I need your modified version back afterwards. Yeah. Cool. Awesome. Yeah.